So good afternoon, everyone. The budget 2024 is out and we have had some uh, good admissions that have been made by our uh, Honorable Finance Minister, Nirmala Sita Raman. She's uh, identified quite a few areas which require a big thrust. And we are obviously going to see a light, bigger light of them in the main budget that we will see in July. But the interim budget indeed was a good one in terms of uh, giving us a scope of things as to where the government's trust is likely to be, the new government's trust is likely to be in times to come. Uh, so right from, um, you know, uh, the in improving the income of the middle, uh, middle households in India, or the thrust on the sustainability or thrust on uh, climate change, the EV sector, which has already seen a big push by the government is going to further be seeing a greater rise. Uh, all in all, it's a budget which is very positive. It's a budget that is very inclusive in terms of, you know, how we want um, a, a bigger push for the Indian population, Indian um, Indian sort of uh, the middle income group to be able to do more. Nari Shakti, of course, which was again an important aspect that was touched, um, is something that is to be looking forward to. So here, Entrepreneur today is going to talk about the top uh, budget uh, news that have happened and we're going to be joined by various experts who will tell us about their thoughts and the insights that they have got from the budget and what inclination do they see for the budget that will come out in July 2024. So we're glad to have with us uh, Mr. Sandeep Bahamar from Green Frontier Capital and we have also got Mr. Ankur Mansal from Black Soil. Let me start with you Sandeep. Uh, good to have you here with us and thank you for joining us uh, post-budget review. Uh, so given the fact that, you know, uh, the government has been focusing a lot on uh, sustainability and climate change um, as a very big aspect. So given uh, that today uh, in within budget also um, um, our finance minister put a thrust on it, what are your views and what do you see um, as a future investment rolling out of it? Yeah. So first of all, um, I think that the Indian finance minister uh, played the balancing act really well. Uh, this was obviously a vote on account budget because it's an interim budget. So obviously we're going into an election kind of time period. So, you you know, it was expected that there would not be any huge big bang reforms per se in this budget. Um, and so the emphasis largely was on fiscal consolidation and a report card of sorts to basically highlight what the government had achieved over the last 10 years, last decade or so. Also, what was surprising and pleasantly surprising was the 5.8% uh, fiscal uh, deficit uh, number that the government announced, which obviously indicated a, a cautious fiscal approach. But what was clear in this budget, which was great for us because we are a climate change fund, is the government's continued commitment to addressing climate change as a big trust area. So whether it was in the uh, in respect of you know basically the rooftop solarization uh, that they spoke about one crore homes being uh, you know potentially solarized from the rooftop perspective or setting up of incentives for creation of charging infrastructure to create employment um, or you know even basically forcing uh, not forcing but actually incentivizing the use of electrical vehicle buses for public transportation to transition to the EV, uh, you know, kind of economy, EV-based economy, were all areas that we found, you know, were very, very interesting and, and promising for, for, for this area. So, you know, climate change obviously continues to remain a, a big area for the government in terms of uh, focus. So what, what manifestations do you see for the startup sector, particularly in the, in the space of sustainability, in the space of uh, solar, um, you know, how 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 do you see them making more big bang investments? Do you think as a whole, uh, the VC um, VC firms are likely to uh, shell out more dollars in, in these um, industries in the times to come? So India obviously has been a beacon of growth in, in an otherwise fairly dull emerging markets sort of scenario. Um, and if you look at S&P, uh, they've actually said that, you know, if you were to look at on a compounded annual growth basis, uh, over the next three years, which is the economy that's actually going to be driving global emerging market growth. In fact, global growth period, uh, people have talked about India. And as the country industrializes, uh, what goes on parallelly is that their greenhouse gas emissions uh, are a perfect, uh, you know, are an obvious um, side effect of that. 
So you can't solve the world's climate problems uh, without solving India's climate problems. Um, yeah. So so the benefit of actually uh, India right now is that it offers strongest economic growth and also strongest potential to replace incumbent technologies uh, that are fossil fuel based in both of, both in terms of uh, you know pricing as well as in terms of performance. And therefore, um, I believe that the uh, VC community has incredible amounts of dry powder available uh, to chase climate change in India. Um, and obviously, India offers a very wide range of uh, industries in, 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 in which to play climate change. Yeah. I mean, so whether it's renewable energy, whether it's electrical vehicles, whether it's precision fermentation, whether it's consumer lifestyles, you name it, you know, we have that. And with a 1.4 billion population tailwind behind you, uh, you know, it's an incredible opportunity right now. Great. Thank you very much, Sandeep, um, you know, for sharing that. Of course, uh, yeah. we do, do feel that uh, particularly with the startup sort of riding the big wave of EVs, which we've already seen in a very large way in India, uh, we would love to see what more is on offer. So thank you for joining us today. And, uh, and we'll, of course, uh, you know, maybe in, in an hour or so, if you are still free, we'd love to have you join us. Absolutely. I'm, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Sandeep. Right. Um, Ankur, I gonna, I'm going to switch on to you. So the budget, of course, uh, talks a lot about, you know, how uh, we are seeing um, an inflation being controlled, how we are seeing greater earning that is happening for uh, the middle class India, you know, there. And, and of course, governments and Mr. Modi's trust itself on, uh, you know, women being more inclusive part of the workforce, Nari Shakti being the, the, the campaign slogan that is importantly being uh, led out uh, in, in this budget and also in the campaign at large. Uh, so what what are your views in terms of, you know, the workforce? We had already with, with AI on top of us, we are already seeing a lot of sort of change in uh, the future of work and workforce and workplaces uh, that is happening. So particularly, what are your views on um, how how the greater earnings and and also towards more uh, more women being in the workforce is going to bring a change in the workplace as such in times to come? No, I think uh, India has not uh, been uh, having a great record for women participation over a long period of time. And I think the government has really started uh, doing putting in incentives or, you know, putting in structures in place so that more women obviously become part of the workforce because uh, you cannot have an advanced economy being built out with half of population not being part of the overall growth of the economy. So I think uh, there are been focusing on these areas and it is sort of something where uh, it is something that we all have to sort of, you know, as an uh, ecosystem come together and support this uh, overall economy. The larger part of the women obviously is in the rural part. And in the rural area, they have not spoken about, you know, they want to increase the number of Lakhpati DDs that can be there, right? And uh, provide more credit assistance to them, right? As we know, the entire microfinance industry is also supporting the women entrepreneurs in the rural areas and semi-urban areas as well. So a lot of these areas sort of can obviously add to the growth on top of it when we are adding a lot of the startup ecosystem areas from an EVs perspective or uh, whether you look at agri-tech perspective, this is all also going to add further enhancing the uh, job situation in the in the rural area, which adds further to the overall economy, right? Because uh, if a consumer business is looking to grow in the rural area, it's not possible if the economy, the agrarian economy, the uh, society around it is not doing well, right? And they are also trying to give more mudra loans as well to women entrepreneurs right. to sort of give them the further incentives to, you know, take it further. Then talking about affordable housing, uh, providing again housing to them, again, where women becomes a very key part of uh, the uh, part of the credit assessment when uh, NBFCs, etc., you know, funding some of the uh, potential applicants out there, right? So with all these things happening, when they're trying to grow the poultry sector, the dairy sector, the aqua sector, all of this directly, indirectly, women participation is extremely high. And uh, the more healthcare is also provided to them, again, that also improves, has a compounding effect for them to be part of the economy back again. So I think it's a, overall a very positive, uh, I would say, a budget, considering that it's an election year, it could have been more populist. Uh, which was the fear of the market, etc. Uh, but it didn't go throughout in that direction. A lot of talk about digital technology, startups in the overall speech. Uh, I think the overall uh, economy, everybody understands that jobs is going to be important. Startups are going to play a key role in that. 
uh, our uh, larger market for startups is beyond the India top 8, 10, 15 cities. It's also the Bharat part. Uh, and uh, I think together with the government initiatives on CAPEX, etc., it always puts a further impetus for the startups to again uh, go out and play in the rural area. Right? So agri-tech startups have already been doing in a large way. I think more technology innovations will come in. The impact of deep tech can be taken advantage of that. So a lot of these things together becomes a very uh, homogeneous way for us to be able to take benefit of the next you know, five to 10 years. And with the deep tech policy also looking to come in place um, as announced in the budget where they want to sort of set another uh, separate uh, you know, regulations for deep tech. So particularly, do you think it's a thrust towards a bigger regula um, regulation of AI you know, as such? Correct. So I think, see, AI and all, I think it's still very early days, at least for a large population country like us to start seeing an impact on uh, our overall, you know, uh, job participation and labor participation rate. It may have impact in IT services to begin with more uh, than the other larger labor part of it. Uh, but deep tech assets, I think people have been asking for uh, a policy being there because we have now a large uh, five to 10,000 startups who are coming into this space over the last period of time. And uh, there is not much... We see funding going to the space, right? Because the revenue generation, the technology part of it takes a long time from a gestation period perspective. And this kind of financing uh, becomes very interesting way for them to be able to tap, right? So a lot of the IITs, IMs obviously have multiple ways of, for them to go and tap some of these uh, capital. A lot of the, we have seen a different space already, like our portfolio company, Idea Forge has now become the poster boy for it. Uh, we started off from IIT Bombay and where they reached finally from the IPO markets. But the, the time horizon that they took uh, thankfully, the drone technology has become now the common thing, but you do not want to miss out on other cycles uh, because for lack of funding. So funding, without funding, you cannot expect us to become uh, doing as, you know, our colleagues, uh, Sandeep was mentioning about, uh, about all the other things in climate that has to happen. So a lot of this requires innovation. All of it requires all kinds of capital. Uh, it requires grants. It requires equity. It requires debt. It requires long-term capital. It requires risk capital. Uh, it requires a family office capital also coming in. So this sort of is very important. Uh, the government taking the, you know, the sort of the first steps towards it also energizes the overall space. They have done it on CAPEX. Uh, on the public side, they did so much CAPEX in infrastructure development. Now private sector is catching up. Yes. I think the same thing they know you could say are they trying to do on the deep tech side as well. Sure. No, I think that's that's very useful. And I'm going to come back to you, Ankur. I'm now going to jump on to Prashant. Uh, Prashant, thank you for joining us. If you can also join us um, on the video yeah i see you now uh, so uh, great thus thank you for joining us here for uh, entrepreneur india's review of the budget um, i see from a tourism standpoint this budget really looks great uh, you know we are already seeing uh, uh, so much infrastructure development happening for airports all over the country and then you know uh, modi ji's uh, self sort of uh, belief in uh, seeing that you know we have more um, beach tourism coming to India from Lakshwadeep and also spiritual tourism with Ayodhya's Big Bang launch of Rong Ram Mandir that we saw. So particularly, you know, I mean, given the fact that there is so much infrastructural development and so much thrust on tourism. So what, what do you think is going to be the outcome of this in the next few months and maybe for this entire year, even before um, the next budget, the main budget is likely to come before July 2024? Uh, no, firstly, thank you for having me over here. Um, you know, th since this was an interim budget, um, honestly, I didn't have much expectation from tourism sector, uh, you know, to be said. Um, and I think government has also done pretty well to not to politicize this uh, interim budget and uh, leave a lot of carrots uh, so that they can, you know, they can hope that people will come back, people will give them back, uh, you know. So, but I was surprised uh, that uh, tourism actually got a very good push even in this interim budget. Out of 15, 20 major points which were shared, around four or five of them uh, were related to tourism and infrastructure related to tourism. So that's a that's a huge boost for the entire tourism sector, according to me. Uh, for the last 10 years, government has been focused on Make in India as a campaign. Now, right. I think in the last couple of years, government has started focusing on travel within India as a campaign. Right. And clearly, this budget also showed uh, significant signs towards it where uh, the mentions related to luxury, spiritual tourism, and all of this also took place. So clearly, uh, government is uh, hell focused on getting tourism uh, to be activated uh, as a uh, domestic tourism uh, rather than people spending money out. And I think it's in the right direction. I'll basically, case in point, I'll talk about Banaras. Banaras, 10 years ago, used to see 25 to 30,000 tourists on daily basis. 
Now that number has jumped to 4 lakh to 5 lakh wow. on daily basis. Now imagine if only 100, only 1000 rupees per tourist is spent in that particular city. Imagine the kind of impact that city is seeing right now with that tourism coming. And yeah. you know, India is ought to be the world leader related to culture and uh, spirituality, right? So it's surprising that so far, uh, till, till now, we did not have a place like Vatican City or Makkah and Medina within our country. Right. Uh, with, with the resurgence of Banaras and uh, Ayodhya and few more other places which are coming in, I believe that uh, we could actually have uh, another Vatican City, uh, not just for Hindus to travel to these places, but uh, from people from across the globe to actually come and visit these places. Uh, you know, India has ought to be the cultural and uh, spiritual leader for the world. And uh, it's rightly so that we are actually, you know, claiming that place for ourselves at the moment. Uh, again, the other big uh, impetus which I saw in this uh, interim tourism, which I was very surprised by, was giving interest-free long-term loans yes. to tourist destinations. Now, this was precisely the need of the hour. A patient capital was required uh, to places. For example, you know, there's this place called as Yucatan region in uh, Mexico. You know, in 1980s, uh, Mexican government decided that they are going to create a place which could be the center of excellence for for people from the U.S. to come and, you know, go over there. And hence, they created a place like Cancun in a matter of four to five years. Right. And uh, Cancun now generates almost 4% of entire GDP of Mexico. Mexico. Correct. So imagine if we actually take this onus on ourselves. India has tremendous amount of hidden gems like Lakshwadeep. Lakshwadeep, according to me, had been sleeping giant for ever since. So, and, and especially since these kind of places like Lakshwadeep, Andamans are second to none in terms of, you know, tourism related to beach uh, vacation. I believe that this is also our responsibility to showcase the power India has in terms of natural beauty and, and present it to the world for, for them to also experience India in such manner. Uh, gone are the days when India was known as snake charmer or cow dung uh, places, uh, <laughs> you know we are we are a country uh, with from top to bottom we have hundreds and hundreds of places uh, which world must see, and first and first for that is for us to see it's ourselves uh, see ourselves right? right. So you know giving long term loan interest free loan to such places um, I think would mean a lot. Uh, I cannot even fathom the amount of value it will bring to Indian tourism sector. I mean, yes, uh, aviation-wise, the numbers are growing. We are one of the fastest aviation-growing country in the world. There's no other country which can say that 100 new airports are going to come in the next decade except for India. Correct. So for all these things, India was growing in the right direction. But I think giving, uh, you know, interest-free loan to tourist destinations and, you know, making them as a center of excellence was my biggest takeaway. Uh, in this entire budget. Sure. And do you think uh, we're also going to see a bigger thrust in sort of ancillary um, sectors that are related to tourism, sectors like hospitality, retail, uh, you know, restaurants? Uh, because, you know, obviously, you know, we need uh, uh, people to, when we want people to visit uh, either for religious tourism or for holidaying, uh, we would need a bigger sort of play coming from these sides also. So do you sort of, what kind of... Um... For me, India is a very fairly well-developed, uh, you know, capitalist market where uh, I have tremendous amount of faith in our entrepreneurship. Uh, I'll, I'll actually share my statistics around it. Uh, Harvard uh, Business Study did this research and, uh, you know, for all the students who graduate, uh, the worldwide average of students who are graduating to become an entrepreneur is about 53%. But right. for that, a uh, number for India is about 83%. Sure. So, you know, Indians by innate nature are very entrepreneurial in nature. Um, as mud, as the development starts happening, uh, all these things related to, uh, you know, hospitality, related to hotels, related to restaurants, uh, you know, will be lapped up by the entrepreneurs uh, of this country. Uh, related to local transportation, even for that matter, would be lapped up. And uh, I have tremendous amount of faith in our entrepreneurship uh, spirit. And hence, I do not think that that will become any foundation for the country to grow its tourist uh, spots in, in India. 
and what sort of readiness are you working on you know to sort of uh, make the most of this big bang tourism that is going to come to uh, happen in the next few no, weeks the second largest uh, travel portal in the country uh, fastest growing travel second largest travel portal in the country i believe that uh, we are very well poised to cap you know capitalize on this growth uh, whether it's related to aviation whether it's related to hospitality whether it's related to sightseeing uh we are extremely well poised uh, uh, to capitalize on it uh, but more than any business at this moment i'm just happy for the country at this yes. moment i'm Certainly, just you know think... i'm just extremely happy for the country and uh, you know as entrepreneurs uh, i think uh, and as a company i think we have done fairly well uh, more than anything of that i'm just uh, really excited about the future of the country and i'm looking forward to create uh, you know at least 10 15 yuktans for the country uh, in the next decade Sure. sure. Thank you very much for joining us, Prashant. That is a that is a great sort of point of view that you've brought to the table, and I think we're going to continue these discussions as to what more uh, and what more areas are likely to benefit uh, from the announcements made today. Um, but uh, great, thanks for sharing your insights today. At this point, I'm also going to ask my colleague Punita Kapoor to join us uh, for this discussion, and uh, we would uh, sort of take this discussion forward with our other panelists. Uh, we have got. um i see mr rahul agarwala who's joined us from um sensei Sen yeah so punita if you want to proceed the discussion thanks. for thanks ritu and thanks rahul and uh, raju for joining us rahul we have seen some uh, interesting announcements around the research and innovation part and particularly it's a happy time for uh, deep tech startups so want to hear your side absolutely i think uh, the government has been quite supportive of both startups and the entire deep tech sector uh the budget continues that i think they've announced a 1 lakh crore uh, fund to give uh, loans for r and d and deep tech i think that's a great initiative uh we need more capital i think uh, deep tech is a capital hungry sector and the government's efforts towards providing that capital and that to patient capital uh will go a long way in helping our startups really scale up and do innovation which is required see innovation is different for every Uh, needs are different right our country's needs given our population given our democracy you know all the demographics we have are going to be different we'll have a much larger thrust on education on agriculture uh, and health than maybe some of the other things and we have the people and the technology to uh, really solve those problems actually not only for ourselves but for the globe so uh, government support here is really really great uh even extension of the tax benefits for startups uh, investments the for yeah. pension funds etc is also to my mind a great uh, so i'm very happy with the budget pleasantly surprised uh, everybody was saying this may be just a continuation of what has been coming but some of the steps announced uh, by the finance uh, honorable finance minister were really really positive so sure. raju i would like to uh, bring you here in and uh, what more do you think uh, of course there were a lot of expectations from startups with regards to taxation but uh, the current pension funds and other uh, taxation aspects which would be of help can you analyze that for our viewers yeah sure uh, thank you very much for having me on this esteemed panel uh, as uh, people must be aware not nothing much was expected uh, as such uh, on the tax front but the extension of uh, tax holiday for uh, eligible startups and uh, as rahul also mentioned and units in ifsc or the sovereign wealth fund or pension funds uh, that uh, gave the confidence to these investors that uh, the government means business and uh, they will continue to support uh, the investments made uh, <clears throat> by these sectors uh, uh, which will uh, result into promoting uh, economic growth uh, that and economic growth and momentum that uh, we are seeing over the years okay sure but do you think uh, when we will have the full budget in july uh, there would be much more announcement with regards to direct and indirect taxes for uh, the general audience for sure uh, because see one of the i would not say a, a miss but uh, there was a lot of expectation on uh, increasing the sunset uh, for new manufacturing companies which is uh, which has a sunset clause uh, for 31st march so there was expectation that it will also get extended which has not happened hopefully that will happen uh, uh, in in uh, in the main budget uh, 
there were talks about rationalization of capital gains taxes and tds provisions mm -hmm. uh, you know given that there are multiple computation for capital gains also for tds multiple sections although it has benefited government in increasing the tax base but the time has come to rationalize some of it uh, to to just reduce the compliance burden uh, so all these uh, we expect that uh, will get covered uh, in the in the main budget uh, along with some uh, announcements around uh, international tax like beps 2.0 which has gained momentum in uh, in eu and other developed economies uh, but we also need to do our bit to support the indian multinationals which are operating across the globe okay sure and overall i mean uh, from the infrastructure point of view uh, do you think uh, this would be a happy time for them yeah of course uh, it's not just happy times for this year but if you look at uh, past years as well the the spend on infrastructure has uh, you know if i just take the numbers it was 5.5 lakh crore in 21 22 and this year we are talking about 11.11 lakh crore which is just uh, double in in 3 years uh, which, which is tremendous and uh, and which and it has a ripple effect mm -hmm. the investments in infrastructure has a ripple effect not just uh, for getting the infrastructure ready which is supporting uh, associated industries like uh, steel or uh, cement uh, the employment also tourism uh, better infrastructure in terms of road airports ports and uh, other things also uh, so it it has a lot of ripple effect on the economy and that that that's a great thing that the government has continued the thrust on uh, investment in infrastructure sure and uh, rahul i'll just come again to you uh, so as company uh, again uh, that we talk about uh, investing in deep tech and innovation uh, do you want to uh, take us through the kind of investment you as a company would be doing in the space Oh, um, so we we focus on early stage artificial intelligence companies. We think it's the you know the age of AI. Twenty twenty three saw a lot of excitement around it, but we've been investing for the last few years in the sector, and uh, we support companies which are actually doing innovation, which are building intellectual property. We call the strategy thick IP. Mm -hmm. uh, so not just companies which are using artificial intelligence because everybody will use AI, but companies that are building AI. So those are the kind of uh, and where R and D is being done, which is why I was so uh, you know excited by the government's announcement uh, today. And uh, we look at across sectors because AI affects literally every sector, every business that you can think of, every consumer. I mean, you already are using AI in your phone. Uh, that opportunity comes once in a lifetime, where every industry is impacted by the same kind of technology. and uh, we are looking at today the cost of ai are high some of the things which are challenging is that the cost is high but this cost curve is a declining cost curve uh, and much like cost of chips ram so many things just keeps going down it completely changes the ball game and that oh, is queen. what our investment philosophy is <laughs> okay sure So thank you for uh, sharing your perspective. Uh, thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Raju, for joining us today here. And uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank thanks. you. Thank you for having me. Okay, we'll conclude it here. Thank you so much.